A. So today is March 12th, 2024, and the time is 3.08. We are in Pittsburgh, New York. Um, my name is Elliot Gavin. I'm an RIT student. I'll be interviewing Manfred Remmel, who is an alumni of RIT. Um, he graduated in 1948 and 1957. So before we start this, um, do I have your verbal consent to record this interview? You certainly do. <laughs> okay. He's also my grandpa. So. Yep. Yep. She's also my little girl. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, can you give us a little background? Why did you decide to come to RIT? All right. I'll try to make it brief because it is a long one. <laughs> my last year in high school... Uh, which I graduated in three years, Monroe High School. I took graphic arts, and uh, I was so successful in it that the beginning of my last year, 1945, I uh, I started work with Lawyers Co-op Publishing Company as an apprentice, the old-fashioned apprentice way of doing it, as a book printer, of which there were not many and there still are not many. And uh, I did a very good job, so much so I didn't have to go my fourth year in high school, and I won a scholarship to RIT, but it wasn't RIT, it was Rochester Athenaeum and Mechanics Institute. Mm -hmm. And I was in there for two years, and then they changed it to RIT, Rochester Institute. Rochester Institute of Technology. And uh, I did four years in there, actually. Four real years. And then I came back later on and finished up on other subjects yeah. for different uh, things I wanted to be as a teacher. What was your major at RIT? My major at RIT uh, was press work. Press work. Um, so you said you kind of decided that from having that um, experience your last year of high school? Yes, absolutely. And uh, my teacher was very satisfied. Hmm. Was it, did you live on campus? No, I didn't live on campus. Uh, I did for about uh, two months. I lived on Plymouth Avenue. That's where the campus was Yeah. Uh, in Rochester. And I lived uh, on Plymouth Avenue on the second floor in a, a residence that also had other RIT students. Mm -hmm. And I stayed there for so long. And then it was a lot cheaper to go back home. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't live too far away, about 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, was the printing program, would you say it was pretty big? It was very big. It went from Plymouth Avenue, one building, an old, old building from the 1800s, as I remember it, to a brand new first precast uh, concrete building in the United States, which they started in 1945 in the fall of the year, using the bedrock also for a foundation for it from the uh, Genesee River, of which they had a donkey engine situated on an island in the Genesee River that went ahead and blasted out the uh, the uh, uh, stone, granite, granite huh. stone. Was RIT, how did RIT look at that time? Was it just like a couple buildings? Well, there was, uh, I cannot think of the name of the building now behind the build, the uh, uh, brick building, mm -hmm. but it was notorious. All <laughs> notorious, yeah. <laughs> it was noted all over uh, the world for being good for art. Yes. And uh, I believe it still is today. Now it's in a different section, but it was noted for that. They would come from all over the world. We saw that. We saw that happen. Did you spend a lot of time on campus? I have as much time as I could, but I uh, would go to school in the daytime. 
until approximately 3 o'clock, 3.30. And then I would go work for Lawyers Co-op until 9 o'clock at night, sometimes 10. And on weekends, I would work Saturdays, and if they needed me on Sunday, I would work Sundays. Yeah. And at this time, you were about, while you were getting your degree, you were about like 17, 18? I was 16 years of age when I started this degree. And uh, I uh, was there for four years straight and came back later on for different things, for uh, some more uh, courses. Mm -hmm. Did you have a favorite place on campus? Well, yeah, it was the girls' dormitory on the street behind us. <laughs> Papa. <laughs> and uh, I was in Chi Delta Phi, and uh, our sister sorority, which I don't remember the name, I was there. And we had dances, and it was particularly on Friday nights and Saturday nights. And we'd go up there in the dorm. It was a, a, a real hotel up there, and uh, it was well coordinated and well attended uh, by teachers and uh, naturally by the students. Um, I had a specific request in this interview to ask you about the nightlife at RIT. I've heard there was, a guy, I guess, a bar around. Do you remember? Yeah, there was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I was too young, and I had to watch my P's and Q's. Uh, yeah, there were two bars. One was on the same street that the girls' dormitory was on, and uh, which I can't think of the name right now. That's okay. And um, the other one was off of uh, West Main Street, and uh, we used to refer to it as the hole of the wall. And uh, all the people would go down there, and they would... Uh, have their whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. No. Um, what kind of classes did you take at RIT? Was it, well, how was printing like split up? Well, you had the regular courses that you would normally take in the college. Um, I, um, Psychology 101, naturally. Physiology uh, was equivalent to 101. I think it was the same number, but I think it was 101A. And we had a Professor Thompson teaching that, and he was quite a, quite a teacher. He taught at the University of Rochester for years, and he would come down and help out uh, at uh, RIT. Did you have a favorite professor? Uh, not really, because I was never around that much to go ahead and uh, do a lot of things. Yeah. I didn't get to know all the professors. Although there was a woman teacher and they took her out. She started as a student, as I understand it, and then she uh, was from the WAX in the Army, the Women's Army Corps. And uh, she took over, she had the credentials for English and she taught English. Interesting. Yes, and I can't, she married, she married a professor from there hmm. later on. She was very nice. Yeah. And I don't know where she came from, but they told me she came from Vermont. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> um, what kind of technology did you use for printing? Well, it was everything from the 1800s right straight through the 1900s. And uh, different machines were... Uh, Prototypes were brought over to be uh, practiced on over there for uh, uh, setting up copy uh, computerized. Hmm. And uh, it was belt driven, I remember, and it was hard to, to change fonts. You had to change fonts for the different types of things that you were setting up. And uh, they used to complain about that very much because it was just in its infancy. I remember that, but they wouldn't let me on it. They said I was too young. I was 16 when I saw that. So I can't tell you too much about it, although Lawyers Co-op got it about four years later. Did Lawyers Co-op, like, did they want you to go to get your degree in um, R at, at RIT? Well, they were a bit blasé about that. Uh, they just wanted to have me there for the uh, 
uh, for what I was there for, learning the trade. Uh, we did a lot of government work and a lot of book work for uh, uh, the different universities around, mostly the University of, <coughs> University of Rochester, <coughs> and uh, did some for uh, Oswego at Syracuse, and I did a, quite a little bit for uh, Buffalo, hmm. bu the old Buffalo U. And uh, I never lacked in my English. I learned an awful lot how to go ahead and watch out for certain things. <laughs> yeah. And I'm always criticizing the newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> what, you said, um, like what types of machines did you use? Like linotype did you use at RIT? Yes, there was, for casting, it was uh, lead type normally that they would cast and that they would print from lead type before uh, offset lithography really got going in there. And what I started on in the basement of that uh, building on Plymouth Avenue, which was the headquarters of RIT, was the linotype, the inner type. Uh, those were two casting machines. They had, uh, as I remember, they had 98 equivalent to 98 keys. Some keys were double and they were laid right out in front of you. It was a, it was a big uh, uh, thing to go ahead and print from. The first two lines were E-T-A-O-I-N, S-H-I-R, L-D-U. And I always remembered that because we used to call each other some phony names from the lighter type. <laughs> Papa. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, you just did that. And uh, I got very good at it, and I thought maybe I would even have that job over there. They had a lot of lighter type and inner type over at uh, Lawyers. The monotype machine went with it. They cast, the, the monotype cast the individual characters in different fonts, different sizes. And uh, it was going all the time, 24 hours a day. We were a good outfit in there. There were very good people over there. Do you have a favorite font? Gaudi, Gaudi text. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Gaudi. Anything in the Gaudi family, but the text was one thing that we got into. We gave it the name text, oh. and one of our professors got the chair. The got the chair for Gaudi, <laughs> and I always liked that. It was right. It's an old face. Yeah. And, uh, and I said a lot of that by hand too. Yeah. Um, what what were the kind of like the printing classes like? Were they more of like the professor would teach you and then you would do it, or were they more like lecture style? More lecture styles because they didn't have the room. There were so many students. When I went there, they were basically all people come from the armed forces that were getting in there at that time, with a few here and there from overseas. They came over there. But in our class, in graphic arts, I call it graphic arts, that's what they call it then. Uh, when I got in there, there were somewhere around 120 odd students, 125 students, and out of 125 students, there were four civilians, I call that that way, <laughs> that had not been in the service. And one was a girl, and uh, she was from Vermont, and one was a boy, that was 19 years of age. He was from Blossom Road, and his name was Robert Dalen. And uh, anyway, I could think yeah. of her name too, but right now I, I, I can't. <laughs> Speaking of your classmates, did you have any like friendships that you formed at RIT that lasted? Yes, I did. And uh, Quite a few of them went to work for the Democrat and the uh, Democrat and Chronicle and the Times Union. Uh, some worked on the presses, some worked in the composites, uh, compositories uh, where they composed all the stuff, and some did uh, just the proofreading. And they took from uh, RIT first and foremost anything in the United States, any college or anything. They took them because they found out that they found good workers there. Mm -hmm. That was one thing that we did know, and we saw the proof of it, and uh, we were very glad to be associated.
Yeah. Okay. How is your um, like, how do you meet your how do you meet people? Did you meet them in class? Did you meet them outside of class? You met them all over campus, but mainly down in the cafeteria. Oh. The cafeteria was in one side of the old building, way in the basement, and it was huge. They had, they had a, a rather, uh, well, why not? They had a rather hefty woman that was in charge of it, and she was just like your mother. If you didn't finish your food, she wanted to know why. And if you ever went near an ash can, she was there. <laughs> and she would want to know how come. Everything was handmade there, everything at that time. And it was very good, farm, farm style. I can't say anything bad about their meals. Was it the only place to eat on campus? Like the cafeteria? That was the only one. There was no other thing. The building was small compared to today. It wasn't even uh, thought of in comparison to the buildings you have today. <laughs> no. Um, did you consider other options for schools? I forgot to ask you this. Yeah, Syracuse University. I had a way of getting into Syracuse. I always liked that place. Uh, they have a wonderful library, of which I used later on when I became a teacher. And, uh, yeah, they were very good, certain things that I was interested in. But RIT, would you say you picked it because it was kind of close to home? Well, that had to be because uh, <laughs> things were expensive. Like I say, I got a scholarship, so all I had to do was pay for my books and transportation. And uh, basically, uh, during the year, I got a job uh, during lunchtime. I wasn't I wasn't eating then in the in the cafeteria. Uh, I went out on Exchange Street there, and I got a job bussing tables. But I got my meals free. Where'd you bus tables? It was right across. Well, <laughs> it's uh, not too far from RIT. It's around the corner from. Uh, uh, lawyers Co-op, you come out of Aqueduct Street, you come right on to Exchange Street, make a right-hand turn and go down about a hundred feet, look across the street, and uh, the uh, restaurant used to be right across the street next to Old Weeds, which is not there either. That whole block was taken out and replaced later on. And then I would get my supper down there too. Uh, I'd bust for an hour hour and a half or something like that, hour, and I get something to eat quick and I go into work. That way there, we didn't have that much uh, uh, money in the family. Things were not that, uh, not that good. Yeah. So there it is. <laughs> after you graduated from RIT, did you, you ended up working at Lawyers and Co-op or what came right after? I never quit working at Lawyers Co-op since 1945 until I went in the Army in 1950. And after I got out of the Army, I stopped into Lawyers Co-op on my way home. And I asked when I could start my job again. They said, how about tomorrow? <laughs> and I said, that, that was on a Monday that I stopped in there. And I said, I can come in here on a Wednesday. <laughs> so I started work that, that Wednesday. And I never gave up working there until 1969. Um. Did you have other people from RIT that went to end up working for Lawyers and Co-op? Yes, and they worked primarily for the photography bit for later on and uh, for making plates, uh, stereotypes, electrotypes, uh, that type of thing. They came over there for, uh, for that. Uh, we had a little go with uh, RIT on some of that procedures. They didn't have the actual equipment for it, but they had a lot of photography that you could go by, and they, they really did a good job with it. Did you, so you learned how to like print photos on paper? Uh, photos were not from electro, uh, they were from uh, electrotypes that we used, and uh, they were basically copper, copper plates. 
and sensitized and of course etched and uh, they would last a great deal we get sometimes 5,000 copies off of them wow which is very very good and if you really want to work on it uh, you'd print something like 50,000 copies you'd have to, you'd have the same pictures and triplicates you just replace them when it started to wear you always had to use a magnifying glass one on your eye and one in your hand to go ahead and uh, go over it. It was quite a tedious job, but we did print stuff for uh, to different schools, colleges, universities, and of course the uh, lawyers. That was yeah. the big thing. That's where they got their name. Makes sense. Lawyers and cooperating. Yeah, lawyers cooperating. Um, at RIT with the printing classes, like we're. Were, was a printing class like on like based on like type of printing like do you think you would have a class on like monotype uh no we didn't have a class on monotype uh as a great matter of fact they had one at that time they had one linotype in the in the place uh they had, yeah one linotype you specified linotype uh, Intertype was the other one. They had about four or five of them, and they whatever <laughs> you you use what you get the price on. Yes. We, we found that out, and uh, they were always in good shape, though, well taken care of. We learned how to maintain them too. And uh, you, if you worked there and used them, you learned to maintain them where you didn't use them. How did you get graded? Like, did you have to do like practicals? Most, like, most of it was practical. Most of it. Yeah. They would, you would get through the instructional period, which sometimes would take three days. In a, a class each, each day you went in there, which was not every day. It was like uh, one session of three days a week and another session two. And the sessions would last anywhere from an hour to two hours a time. It depended on what you were doing. And uh, you you really you really learned the trade. There was no two ways about it. I'm very very pleased with what I did. Do you feel that like RIT helped prepare you for your job at lawyers and co lawyers and co-op? Well, the thing of it is, sections of it, yes. But the type of printing to be a book printer, especially, uh, that wasn't taught at RIT. A general printing in general was taught. Uh, general, generally what you did on machines, uh, your verbalization and everything else uh, was taken into consideration. And if you didn't know how to <laughs> speak the way they wanted you to speak, you went ahead and you were uh, taught how to speak. <laughs> and uh, your uh, the way you spoke, Rochester is noted for having a slang. Well, they didn't want to see any part of that. And uh, they outed that right off the bat, which was very good. Like when N NTID started, uh, with the, when they were getting ready to, to build, uh, I uh, filled out for that job and I would have been ahead of it. But my assistant was a PA. Uh, uh, a professor already and I wouldn't have stood a chance for him he was a PhD and uh, my I had the least of the credentials so I figured I better not take that one so I went back and did what I did <laughs> yeah um, do you have like a favorite RIT memory yes I do and uh, I think of the man that was in charge of us all, and uh, he, he was the head, I guess you could call him manager, we did. Brian Culver was his name, Byron Culver was his name, and uh, he was approximately five foot six, and he was approximately uh, 58 to 60 odd years old. And he made such an impression on me at that time that uh, I would go to him and I'd ask him certain questions and he always gave me an answer. And uh, never going through protocol, 
to go see him. I talked with his uh, secretary, Miss Mrs. Kelly, who was a neighbor of ours on our street, by the way, <laughs> and uh, she would get me right in there for an audience with him, and we do we hash it over for fifteen minutes, sometimes longer. Well, did he was he, very good, very good. Did he work at RIT? Yeah, he, he was the uh, department head. Department head? Of printing? Of printing. The whole printing graphic arts. All of it. Got it. And uh, uh, I like certain parts of the uh, the curriculum that was really, really, really good. Uh, what were your favorite parts? Well, the old-fashioned printing, I told you before. Calligraphy. Oh. Calligraphy. I like calligraphy very, very much. And I have held on to it right through my, part of my marriage till I gave my tools away to one of my nephews. He got into something that was akin to it. And, uh, yeah, he wound up running a gas station. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. that's how it goes. I didn't know they taught calligraphy. That's very cool. Yeah. Is that it? No. We're still <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so a little bit more about the culture at RIT. Were you involved, other than your fraternity, which we'll talk about, were you involved in any, um, you know, other activities or clubs? Yeah. They had a, a ping pong club. And once in a while, if you had the chance, you'd cut class to play ping pong, especially if there's a match coming up and you were in it. <laughs> and uh, I didn't do that very often. I had very good grades, and uh, I couldn't do it. But I was good at ping pong, and uh, yes, that was one. Wow. They, uh, they had a dancing, uh, dancing, I don't know what you'd say, a squad. Dancing club? Yeah, you could say it was a club, but uh, I love to dance, so that would be on a Saturday, most generally. What type of dancing? All types of dancing. Uh, mm -hmm. When I was in grammar school, well, not grammar school, yeah, it was grammar school, come to think of it. Uh, on Friday nights, each church, they'd alternate on Friday nights, and each, each church would sponsor a type of uh, dance. And uh, they had regular dancing, they had uh, the real fancy dancing, they had, uh, if you want to do a hold down square dancing, they had that. And I went to every single one of them and I danced every bit. And I, that's where I learned to dance. So when they had, we had the dancing stuff over at RIT, I got a little bit nosy about it through our uh, uh, fraternity and I used to go there and we used to really cut a mean floor. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, it was good. What's your favorite kind of dancing? Well, just regular plain old fashioned straight dancing. Just dance hall dancing. Dance. And. Uh, my wife and I have taken many prizes in the past over the years. Sure. And it makes me sad that I can't do it anymore. Don't worry. We'll do, yeah. we'll do it again. Yeah, I guess so. No. I'd love to dance with you. Ah, uh, we will. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, how, so what fraternity were you a part of? Chi Delta Phi. You're going to have to write that down after this, because I don't know how to spell it. But um, how did you get into it? I was selected, that's how they do it all, I think they do it all uh, universities and colleges. You are selected. If you want to apply, you can apply before. I never applied, and I was the youngest one in the whole school, 16. Who wants a person 16? Well, there were four GIs just returned from the service and uh, from overseas. And uh, the oldest one was in almost 40, and the majority of them were in their 30s, and one was in his mid-20s. And uh, one day I was walking to the cafeteria, and they grabbed a hold of me, and I won't tell you what they did. But anyway, 
you, you still had that on campus if you were a freshman. And they'd go ahead and they'd get you. And I won't tell you what they used to do to you. But I had to go to class dressed as a girl a number of times. Oh, my God. And that was something else I forgot about just until now. You had to go drag for a month. And oh, my God. Wow. And the sister sororities, you generally took one of them along to school with you. <laughs> Walk you over. Oh. Did they have, a, like, a like a fraternity house? No. No? No, we didn't have a fraternity house. And... Uh, the girls used their dormitory for their fraternity house. There was a there was a boys dormitory though. Yeah, uh, yeah, that, that was on Plymouth Avenue, but that was uh, not like a regular dormitory. Mm -hmm. It was a, a a regular residence run by, shall we say, civilians, and uh, you just went in there and you asked if they had a bed, and that was it. You didn't get anything but a bed in the, in the, in the bathroom, and uh, you you just like in the service. There were about 20 people in the same bathroom. It, but, was, it was a learning experience. <laughs> but you would say a lot of your classmates were in the service or had been in the service, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Would you say that kind of inspired you to go later? In the service? Yeah. Well, I never got homesick when I got in the service because they did such a job on me. I, I was inducted into the service in four years in RIT. And uh, when I got into the armed forces, I did not get homesick in the least. Uh, it's the same same thing uh, with another guy that went in with me. And I, I don't know, I, I probably one of the only people that ever was like that. But uh, no, I uh, almost joined up for, for real after my term was up. But I didn't because there was sickness home. Yeah. And uh, my, I'm the only child, so I helped out. I got out and I helped out. What war did you serve in? I went in in 1950. And uh, that... Was that Vietnam? No, that was South Korea. Oh. Oh. And uh, the Korean <laughs> shindig. That's what yeah. we call it. Uh, President Truman had another word for it, and I know it, but I don't want to say it. You won't. And uh, <laughs> anyway, no, I I spent overtime over there, and I, I in the service. I mean, mm -hmm. not over there. So you graduated in 1948, according to your diploma, um, with publishing and printing, and then you went in the service in 1950. How long were you in the service? Uh, two years, three and a half months. Got it. And then I also saw that in 1957, you got your associates. Yeah. Did you? So you went back to RIT? That's when I picked up the actual thing. I did most of it before. See, RIT couldn't give a baccalaureate until uh, after uh, the 50s. Mm -hmm. They were not certified, and they couldn't give the baccalaureate. So naturally, I didn't go on for a baccalaureate uh, before I went in the service. But I did most of my associate work before I went over it. No. Now, the associate, as, as I knew it, wasn't completed until uh, 19, 1947, and I got it in forty eight. I mean, the, the basic work. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't do the other stuff that they wanted me to do. So when I came back on the GI Bill, I finished out on it, but I couldn't do any more. Got it. I and see. That was it. And there was no time to come back for the baccalaureate. No, and were you with, were you with um, Grandma Norma when you got your associates in 1957? Uh, we were married in 1954. And yes. Uh, but you worked, you worked after, up until, you worked while you got your associate's degree? Absolutely. <laughs> and a lot of night work in there. <laughs> but uh, yes, definitely. Uh, it worked out very well. I'm very pleased with it. I've used it all my life and I can't say enough about it or for it. 
And uh, anybody that can go to RIT, God bless them for it. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'm at RIT right now. <laughs> Kaput. Kaput. <laughs> <laughs> um, other than that, um, sort of... Give me one second. I gotta think of a question. You've been such a good interviewer. Oh, Interviewee. no. Oh, you're special. Uh, um, Normally I wouldn't open my mouth for anything like this. <laughs> no. 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 Did you, so, did you, do you remember any names of people that you were friends with there and what they did? Yeah, they had Bob Taylor there, though, to what I told you about. We got to be awful, very good friends. Uh, he went to Korea. I found out later on he got killed. Oh, I'm sorry. And, uh. I can't think of that girl's name, but I know it. She was very good. She had a heck of a nice uh, a handwriting. And she came from Vermont. She got in some of the heavy stuff, but she branched off in another area. And I cannot think what it was. And she went ahead and made it her major. Huh. And uh, I, I wish I could remember her name now. I didn't know it the other day, and I forget. Do you know any, did you have any, like, relation, did you know anything about, like, upper administration or anything? Did you really care who the president was? No. No. And all I can tell you, the president was well-known and well-liked, and part of his bringing up before he got into education for a job, was this, he was, was a professional wrestler. Well, who, who, which president was this? Was it Mark Ellingson? Yes, that's yeah. who it was, Mark Ellingson. Definitely it was him. Oh my God. Yeah, he was, uh, he had the build of a wrestler too. Did you see him around campus or not really? Oh yeah, he would come around campus and he'd come in. And the only thing I can really remember about him that was a little out of the ordinary, he liked a cup of coffee and he always went over to see what was special in the cafeteria. <laughs> And, uh, he, yeah, he was a good man, Mark Ellingson. Oh, my God, he was good. What was what was the RIT mascot? Well, when it... Was it a tiger? A what? What was the mascot? Like, was it a tiger? Yes, it was a tiger, yes. And, uh, I can't remember too much about it, except one day somebody brought to psychology class a cat fixed up like a tiger. <laughs> and uh, Professor Thompson got all out of whack on that one. And, uh, yeah, I remember that. It and wasn't a real tiger? No, it was, a, it was a cat. Oh, like a little... And they had him fixed up just like a miniature tiger. Aww. It was cute, it really was. Aww. And it was really nice. The guys liked it. That was around the campus for a long time. No. And uh, we had it. Everybody would take care of it. Was um, was there like sports, or not yet? Like yeah, they team? had a they had baseball. Baseball. They had baseball and they had a bowling team. Mm. But uh, and of course the ping pong team. Mm -mm. And uh, if I remember correctly, they had a rifle team. At the in the ping pong team, did you play against other schools or did you play against each other? Ah. Uh, well, we played against each other all the time, mm -hmm. but we would play like uh, Syracuse University, Buffalo, and around like that. And uh, yeah, and there were some other schools we played too, and I can't remember them. Was you? Did you? Was U of R around? I really don't know. Oh yes, oh definitely, that was a big thing even way back then. The riv rivalry? That, yeah, that, yeah. I use that library a, a time and again later on when I was teaching. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I got around all the libraries around. I could tell you what they were noted for as far as I was concerned. But, uh, yeah, that was quite a place. But even then, uh, it, it cost too much to go there. <laughs> 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 and uh, you had to be smart in school. You had to get something, a grant or something. But they were they were closer back then. Oh yeah. 
Definitely. Oh, they were. You, uh, you had to know somebody to get into the University of uh, Rochester. You had to know somebody then, in my time. Mm -hmm. And it was, it, it was mostly political. Yeah. And that I can tell you. That's another reason I like Syracuse. If you had the grades and somebody pushed you and you could get in there, you'd go. They'd take you anytime. I'd like Syracuse. Mm -hmm. Old Buffalo you was a lot like that too. So you were you were you lived in Pittsburgh. I mean you lived in Pittsburgh all the time, pretty much. But yeah. um like you you've always kinda of known about RIT. Yes. But how did you feel when you knew that the original campus was going to be taken down? I felt very bad. As a matter of fact, I had four bricks from the original building. Where? Four bricks. Where, though? I put them in the backyard, <laughs> and I hit them up against the house for a long time, and I saved them. And uh, now those bricks were not the standard bricks that you use for building a building. They were right from the 1800s. And although they had the standard bricks then, these were a little bit longer, a little bit skinnier, and a little bit wider. And I had them. And uh, yeah, kept them. You were sad though when it happened? Oh, I was very sad because uh, I made a lot of acquaintances in there some from, mostly from Pennsylvania that were very, very good. Very good people. Mm -hmm. Very good. And you, I know you've mentioned something about this. Can you talk about the wine cellar? Something about wine. You well, know? that was in the new building. Oh, the new building. Yeah. Okay. They didn't have anything like that down there. There was no room. They used every inch that they had in those days. Everything. All the floors were used. And uh, depended on what you were taking, mm -hmm. and uh, but printing was in the basement. Mostly. Mostly. Mostly, yes. And uh, all your academic subjects were on the main floor Thanks. and around, the second floor. Yeah. And then the cafeteria was also in the basement. Also in the basement, one section of it. Huh. It was a huge thing. The building was a big building, and uh, the cafeteria was partitioned off, but it would hold. If I said right now, it hold a good 300 people, it would hold 300 people. Wow. And the serving line was out of this world. Do you remember anything about the domestic science program? No. No? No, I don't. We talked to, um, in like our classes, we talked a little bit about it, but I think they might have run the cafeteria and made the food. But I'm not sure. No, I can't remember anything about that. What were some other majors? R.I.T. Oh, well, calligraphy was a major. It really was. At that time, there were companies that were looking for people that they could take and use to design uh, covers for their products, whether they be made out of uh, paper, cardboard, or uh, textile. Like packaging? Everything from packaging to clothes, uh, everything. Yeah. Well, we even had one man there. He came from someplace like out in New York City for underwear. And he was looking, <laughs> he, wanted, he wanted women for that one. And uh, not just for women's stuff, but for men's too. And the reason he gave for that, and don't ask me why I remember this, but the guy was something like you. You've heard about people from New York City dressing different. He certainly did. And <laughs> that's still in my mind to this day, the way he was dressed. Oh, my gosh. And, uh, yes, he, uh, he related it right out, and he wanted the girls, and he showed the girls. He was giving girls that were interested. And he'd get around the table, and he'd have stuff that he brought with him. And he showed what he had in mind. Calligraphy, believe it or not, with the Lombardic Uncles, played a big part in that. Now, there's all kinds of Lombardic Uncles, but that the I mean. The what? Lombardic Uncles. I don't even know what that means. Well, that 
Lombardic comes from a time in medieval days. And uncles what was what were the monks when they had him dead by hand for the big capitals, little capitals that were embellished in their Bibles. Yes. And uh, books. Yeah. And uh, whoever they worked with or for their uh, order, they made money by what these monks could do. Yeah. And uh, I never got into, I don't remember all the background on it. I used to know it all. Did you, but you liked calligraphy. Oh, I liked it very much. Yeah. It, it expresses, I think, art. I've, I've always liked a form of art, and my wife is very good at it. I always liked art, and I think it's a part of art. Definitely, it's an art by itself. And they made it into another major if you wanted to take it. And I know you could take it for, t for two years when I was in there, and they said something about three years. They were thinking of doing it before I got out of there. Hmm. So I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if they did do it. If right. they don't do it today, I'm sorry to see it go. It was a wonderful thing. I think we do have calligraphy classes today. I hope so, because I think there's still a use for that. Sometimes I recognize it in modernistic uh, uh, print when they uh, print on paper or on textile, like the the uh, the uh, oh initial for a company or so, and they'll have it all embellished. But it's, sometimes it's embellished just like the monks would do it. I also see it in like if you've ever gotten like a wedding invitation yes, or something. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, something like that. That that would be very good, very good. Or a centennial or something like yeah. that. Yeah, they used to use that stuff all the time. And uh, we used to have sorts cases in the hand type that we used at Lawyers Co-op. And they had some of that over at RIT at the time. They had hand cases over there too, hand type. Mm. And uh, they would have, uh, in the swords cases, all kinds of embellishments in there. All, everything you could use for uh, a diagram or uh, an ancho or any darn thing. I never asked you, but how did you, did you like have a graduation? Did you walk? Or did they just give you the diploma in the mail? Uh, we met in the Presbyterian Church right near uh, RIT at that time, right adjacent to RIT. The pastor of it used to be a worker for RIT, and we used a church to graduate in. And that was a certificate for one year, diploma for two years, and associate for whenever you got it. And uh, I did it in all three. Did you wear a little robe? No robes. No hats? Today they would probably go ahead and wear shorts. <laughs> <laughs> Did you wear, so was it like the head of your program that gave you your diploma? No, it was a uh, <laughs> secretary gave me my diploma. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, but for the certificate and diploma, Dr. Ellington, Ellington gave that out to each and every person. Oh. He gave it out personally. That's nice. And he, call, he looked at it and called you by name. How I still remember that. Aww. How many people were in your class? Well, there was 125 when we went in. And when I came out, there were something like 32, 35, 35 sticks in my head. It's between 32 and 35, but I think it was 35, 35 people. It was not an easy course to get through, believe me. There was a lot to it. What would you say the hardest part was? Well, the hardest part for me was to get there on time. <laughs> and because I had so much going with the other places, 
I was on just about everything going. Every detail they had going in that place for, for either uh, the organization I was in or for the different uh, the different courses I was in. Yeah. Well, the different things that we took, like uh, sociology. We had to make a dummy uh, to show the parts of the anatomy. Oh. And we had to make it ourselves. I made mine out of cloth and stuff that was sand. And I remember that. Sounds intense. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. What, what can I say? Uh, but sociology, psychology, you had to go ahead and uh, come across something that was of psychological interest to you as a person. And you had to present it in such a way, written or practically. And he left it up to you to discuss what it would be. What did you do? What did I do? <laughs> do you remember? Vaguely, I remember. I remember it didn't go over too well. <laughs> but uh, I got hollered at for it, I guess. And uh, I don't actually remember it now. That's fine. Um, it, it was it was an odd thing. It does sound odd. Yeah. But would you say that you enjoyed your time at RIT? Oh, absolutely. I'll tell you one thing right now. Everybody that was in my classes, everybody that was in my classes, everybody, male, female, and the cat, were personal friends. So personal, in fact, it was out of this world. We took one weekend where we got a, an extra day off. It was in the fall of the year. And we were going to class. And this one person from Vermont had a call that his mother was very sick and couldn't come home for a short time. So he got an okay to go. And he was in there, uh, Kai Delta Phi. So they brought it up at a meeting. So we had a 1939 Ford that six of us piled into and went to Vermont where he lived. Wow. And we stayed there, and we stayed there for one night, and we came back, started to come back the next day around noon, and it took us all day to get home because it, it, it was a real old jalopy. But he saw his mother, and she, she was okay. So that, yeah, that's the kind of a friendship we had. Aww. And we had one flat tire coming home. And we all helped change that thing. I'll never forget that. And, uh, yeah. Did you, um, have you seen the new RIT campus? I saw the first buildings that were built because your grandmother used to have to uh, put exhibits for Bosey's number one up there. Huh. And we'd go up there and they'd be up there for two days or three days. And I'd go up there and help your grandmother with the exhibits. Did you think the exams? Did what? Did you helped her with what? Oh, my wife was an art teacher. I'm sorry I should have gone into this. She took what the kids made and exhibited it up at RIT. Oh, exhibited. Okay. I'm sorry I should have said this. No. It was such a big thing. I clean forgot to bring it up with uh, here. That's very cool. But uh, anyway, all kinds of dignitaries came there to see the stuff because Bosey's one was the only one that did it. And uh, you... Your grandmother was noted for bringing stuff from overseas and making it into an exhibit that the children made, not her. And they had everything there. And it took prizes all over. Very was, cool. And uh, we were very proud of it. 
Met a lot of people from RIT down there. No. Would you say that the new, what, what you saw of the new campus looks anything like the old campus? There is no comparison whatsoever. Is there any comparison between, we'll say, 1880s to 2024? No. <laughs> Nothing. Matter of fact, the space is long gone. And uh, what used to be the RIT, the new building, is the Board of Education downtown for Rochester City School District. That's the whole campus. Well, they got it. It was way over on the Plymouth Avenue, too. Yeah. So that's it. I, I miss those days. Yeah. But would you, you would say that RIT helped prepare you for your job? Well, in some aspects of it, it did prepare for parts of my job. But, but since book printing was so... You know, well, printing, actually, what I learned at RIT, what I learned at Lawyer's Co-op for book printing, now that's a printing all by itself. I could have been an associate professor over at RIT, I don't just say that, because there were not that many book printers in the United States. And I knew my job backwards and forwards, and I taught a good many people on the job. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it, there's all kinds of things there that are strange about it. Yeah. That type of printing especially. It, it's, it's hard for me. It would take me hours here to go through it, and I can't do that. But uh, the people that learned that, they were something else. They had intelligence in their mind like you wouldn't believe. Yeah. And uh, they could do things you wouldn't believe with print. To end off the interview, I thought this would be a little fun question. What, when you think of RIT, what's one word you would use to describe RIT? Oh boy, let's see. Well... Happiness. Aww. I mean it. Happiness. Aww. I had so many friends. Even the pussycat on campus. <laughs> and it was a pleasure to be able to go any place on that campus or downtown Rochester, see the people that are on campus, and always be acknowledged and nobody was afraid to say hello. It was wonderful. Okay. I don't know about today. I imagine part of that is in existence. But I still believe in the good old fashioned handshake and the slap on the back <laughs> and hold on to somebody and tell them you really like them. Aww. I do believe it. Well, thank you for being such a great interviewee. And thank right. you for being such a good interviewer. Okay. Well, you want to say goodbye to the camera? Goodbye. I'll be the same camera. <laughs> <laughs>